Hello and thank you for joining us today for this OncLive Peer Exchange panel discussion on the topic of emerging concepts in advanced ovarian and cervical cancers. This program will feature insight from leading experts who conduct their research in the field of gynecologic oncology. My name is Dr. James Tate Thigpen and I am Professor of Medicine and Director of the Division of Oncology and Hematology at the University of Mississippi School of Medicine. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Robert Coleman, Professor and Deputy Chair of the Department of Gynecologic Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Thomas Herzog, a Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Clinical Director of the, at the University of Cincinnati Cancer Institute in Cincinnati, Ohio, Dr. Bradley Monk, Professor and Director of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology and Vice Chair for the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Arizona Cancer Center in Phoenix, and Dr. Angelus Alvarez Secord, Professor in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Duke University School of Medicine. Thanks to all of you for participate, participating in this discussion. First, let's start by talking about ovarian cancer and what's been happening in that field. Uh, and the first topic we want to look at uh, is the whole issue and role of molecular testing in ovarian cancer. Uh, let's start with Dr. Monk and uh, Brad. Uh, ovarian cancer has been labeled as a very heterogeneous disease process molecularly. What's the role of molecular testing in ovarian cancer? Right. So thanks, Tate. It's my honor to be with you. Um, so first of all, when we talk about ovarian cancer, let's be clear, it's fallopian tube, peritoneal and ovarian cancer together. And I know your question was about molecular testing, but, but let's far start with the histology. So we kind of think of ovarian cancer as five histologic subtypes. The clear cell, the mucinous tumors, which are rare and don't respond to chemotherapy, and then the endometrioid tumors and the most common type, serous. And serous can be high grade and low grade. So the low grade tumors, now to your question, uh, have molecular perturbations in the MAP kinase pathway. The high grade serous tumors are characterized by p53 mutations. But what we're going to focus on, I think, during our discussion is that those high grade serous tumors can be bifurcated based on BRCA or genes related to BRCA. So currently we have, to your question, a uh, companion diagnostic, which we'll get into, to test for BRCA, and it's relevant across all tumor types, but it really we're trying to look at those high-grade serous tumors that are BRCA or homologous recombination repair deficiency positive or not. Okay, uh, others? Well, I just think it's interesting, though, you kind of split things up in just those high-grade serous cancers, but some of the newer data is stating that women who have non-serous cancers right. also have a very high prevalence of these mutations in BRCA1 and other homologous recombination defects. And, right. and so I think that's important and that's why the NCCN recommends that women regardless of family history, right. uh, regardless of age of onset, and to your point, regardless of histologic type should still be tested for BRCA, yes. Yeah, I think the other you know, key piece in this is also just the genomic uh, heterogeneity, the, the, a lot of uh, genomic chaos that you see in these tumors. And so while you can, you can split this down a gene pathway, you can also look at it from a, a whole genome kind of situation where there are classes, even within high-grade serous, multiple different subtypes. And I think we s saw a piece of that last year here at this meeting, um, and we've seen several subsequent reports of doing some type of this uh, genomic profiling to actually identify patients that, for instance, have more of an EMT type of, uh, of a tumor as opposed to a more epithelioid type of tumor. So, and the, and the response rates, uh, you know, the paper that just came out in Nature a couple days ago, you know, basically shows in these, in these resistant patients, these people really have completely different types of tumors. Uh, so it's very, very heterogeneous. And the survivals for these different histologic types are remarkably different, yeah. endometrioid and serous uh, being tremendously longer than clear cell. Importantly, there was an abstract that was just presented on the mucinous from the GOG data, and it was interesting. The first part was we think we understand histology. We may not even understand that. 50% uh, were reclassified, yeah, and they exactly. had trouble. They had right. trouble even making a determination yeah, that was of the problem, mucinous yeah. from you know mostly good labs. So. All right. So far, what's been lacking from the discussion is the mention of any specific molecular target mm -hmm. that we can target on the ovarian cancer, or should we say ovarian fallopian tube and peritoneal uh, cancer mm -hmm. uh, cell itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we talked about BRCA as being one molecular target that, um, at least in, in, in a synthetic lethality kind of way, I think we're learning that there are other synthetic lethality targets. It's just not that, not the, uh, well characterized. But, um, 
you know, to Brad's point, you know, in these other subtypes, um, such as low-grade cirrus, he said that there were frequent aberrations in the, in the um, MAP kinase and PA3 kinase pathways. And so identifying, um, activating mutations in those specific subtypes, you know, may or may not actually um, be important targets uh, that will translate into efficacy. So just the presence of the target doesn't necessarily mean. But, we'll but let's response. face it, that's why we've, we've done micro uh, tumor microenvironment research. Mm -hmm. That's why bevacizumab got labeled in ovarian cancer last year. Mm -hmm. That's why we're excited about immunotherapy because of this genetic chaos, this, mm -hmm. this heterogeneity that we can't find the drivers. We find mutations, but many are passengers. Right. So I take it from what I'm hearing that it's fair to say that at the current time, we do not have any specific driver mutation that we've identified that we can target like, for instance, we can in lung cancer or other cancers. Well, other you know, than BRCA. And BRCA. Other, well, yeah, other yeah. than BRCA. So, you know, the one thing I, I think that's important in this discussion is that not only is it just this issue about whether or not there's a specific driver and passenger, and that's definitely important, but even for diseases for which there's a, a pretty well characterized aberration, so for instance, in clear cell. So we know we have these uh, ARD1A you know, uh, mutations in a large proportion of those. You know, what's happened is that we're coming up with better ways to actually do targeting so even though right now we consider that like P53 or MYC is something that's very difficult to actually focus target, our ability to target those genes is also changing. So I think that's an evolving space. So would you say that we ought to routinely get uh, molecular testing done on patients with ovarian cancer? Well, we should routinely, I think, do BRCA. Yeah, I, that, I, okay. I mentioned other, the, other than BRCA. Other than BRCA, <laughs> and again, ASCO, NCC, and the Society of Gynecologic Oncology recommend it, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's not just yeah. about risk-reducing surgery right. because it's a therapeutic target. That's right. But other than that, I don't so, think so. So what's the role of panel testing versus uh, uh, doing something less? Yeah. Well, well I, so one I, of the, I think there's two different issues there. One in being the panel testing for genetic mutations for hereditary predisposition versus tumor testing to deliver targeted therapy to determine how you're going to treat them. Those are very two different right. issues. So what we've discussed at our institution is to consider doing those types of um, tumor testing um, in select populations. So women who have type 1 ovarian cancers that have recurred or women who have high-grade serous ovarian cancers where we know they don't have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation and they've recurred after, you know, we don't know the right answer, but maybe two or three lines of therapy. So for the benefit of those in the audience who may not understand the term type 1 ovarian cancer. Do you want to just give us the breakdown? Of sure. So um, type 1 ovarian cancers would include some of the cancers Brad talked about, like uh, low-grade serous cancers, mucinous cancers, clear cell cancers, and uh, low-grade endometrial cancers. And the type 2 cancers, I would include high-grade serous cancers as well as high-grade endometrial cancers. So the panel testing, so let, let's just make some definitions here. So PARP repairs single-stranded DNA damage. And so if you inhibit that, then you get double-stranded breaks. And if you get double-stranded breaks, they need to be repaired. And one of the ways that that is repaired is through BRCA. And that mechanism of repairing double-stranded breaks is called homologous recombination repair. And Clear, if you don't repair, the, the cell then dies. Have, then the cell dies, lethal. synthetic lethality. Yeah. But there are other homologous recombination repair genes other than BRCA. Yeah. So when I say panel, I mean let's look for other HRD genes that might predict which patients might respond to a PARP inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's untested, but, but we kind of like that because we know that BRAC is not the whole story for HRD. That's right. Okay, so let me see if we can bring this section to sort of a close and move on to another topic. Uh, it, it, if you wanted to sum this up, uh, at the present time, testing for BRCA is beneficial in several ways, but testing for everything else may not give you information that's immediately clinically useful. Is that a fair statement? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay.